A compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. The last word. A white guard lieutenant was detained on the border in 1926. He was a member of the Sokol underground organization, the Falcons, which was operating in the Pavlodar region of Kazakhstan. He'd been to sent to Paris to establish relations with the underground emigrant groups there. There was a real threat of war with France in 1927. The Russians' combined arms union was active in France. It had a strict hierarchy and was ready to start preparations for military action any time. All it needed was arms. It was determined that the lieutenant had met White Guard leader Anankov twice. Then the idea to use the information about the Pavlodar resistance and dispatch their person to the people who were around the Ataman formed. Czechist Likarin became the lieutenant's substitute because they looked alike. Say your name. I'm Boris Anankov. Their aim was to find and destroy. It was 1920. The civil war came to an end. The Bolsheviks triumphed, but the white emigrant movement remained active too. Thus, a decision to eliminate the white guard leaders was made. As a result, Ataman Dutov was killed in the Chinese city Shuiding which was their first successful operation. However, first they had planned to catch him and bring him to trial. They planned to do it to Dutov, but couldn't implement their plan, and a few years later they did it to Anankov. The Ataman's repentance was a secret. Anankov didn't take the Soviet side voluntarily. On the one hand, it looks like history, but on the other, it reminds us of an adventure novel. He even tried to jump off the train when he was being taken to the USSR. Chapter 1. The Lookalike Operation I admit my terrible guilt before the people and the Soviet government. Although I understand that I do not deserve forgiveness for the actions I have carried out in the past, I still want to ask the Soviet government to forgive the mistakes which I made during the Civil War. The Ataman had sold out and joined the Reds. It happened on the 20th of April in 1926. It was sensational news. General Boris Anankov's address was published in a Russian-language Shanghai newspaper. After the article was published in the Shanghai newspaper, General Anankov and Nikolai Denisov, who was the chief of staff, re-immigrated to the Soviet Union voluntarily. However, it's just one of the legends which are still remembered. In 1921, the remnants of the White Army were in China. In spite of this, they continued adhering to their own rules. The Chinese authorities addressed the following complaint to Anankov. Not only your soldiers engage in robbery, but you do the same together with them. At first, local Chinese authorities were puzzled and shocked by the crowds of people who kept arriving. After a few armed clashes took place, the Ataman was detained in Urumqi and sentenced to three years imprisonment. According to some data, his arrest was the beginning of the Czechist complex operations. The situation in China was complicated at that time because a few military officers were trying to seize power simultaneously, and each of them wanted to have a white emigrant's detachment in his army. When Anankov was released, he was offered two choices. But, for some reason, he chose Feng Yuichang, who was called the Red Marshal for his connection with the Bolsheviks. In his troops, there was a detachment where quite a lot of my former partisans served. A month later, I got another opportunity to meet Marshal Feng Yuexiang and told him about my plans to return to the USSR. The Marshal approved of this decision. As a result, I was sent to Moscow through Mongolia on April the 10th. Anankov was writing these lines while waiting for sentence. 
It is said that there were Soviet agents in that white detachment of the Red Marshal. It seems that one of the Czechists' main aims was to attract the Ataman and his people to serving the Red Marshal. In November 1925, Soviet intelligence officer Sergei Likarin was brought to Anankov. Likarin pretended that he was a white guard lieutenant having English journalist documents. The person who led Sergei Likarin to Anankov was Chekashin, one of the former officers of Anankov's convoy. Anankov really trusted him. The Ataman did not notice that it was another man. Likaran was a very look-alike. However, it's unknown what part he played in the Ataman's life. Likaran and Cherkashin offered Anankov a very interesting opportunity to show his worth as a commander and join the Chinese army. According to some data, they weren't able to carry out the operation called the capture. With Likarin's participation, something went wrong. There are questions about the Red Marshal's participation as well. It's said that the Soviet side paid arms to Feng Yuxing for giving Anankov back. It's interesting that a few years later, the Chinese commander died under mysterious circumstances during a visit to the USSR. I'm talking about the Soviet rule's powerful intelligence service. It really was quite powerful. The Ataman met Soviet advisor Vitaly Primakov in Feng Yuxiang's military headquarters situated in the Mongolian town of Kalgan. Later, Anankov was arrested and offered either to choose between a trial leading to execution or repentance and service to the Soviet rule. Anankov is with me. He has promised that neither he nor his chief of staff will try to escape. He will be kept prisoner here and guards will be posted near his door. We have planned our actions concerning him. We will start with the declarative letter of repentance. He will agree to that because he has no choice. He was confronted about it and had no choice. He put him in the car and took him to the USSR. He was abducted, brought to Verny, and then to Moscow. After that, they took him to Kazakhstan again. There, he was prosecuted and then executed in Semipalatinsk. It's unclear whether he agreed to cooperate with them or not. On the way to Moscow, the Ataman made an attempt to escape. He wrapped a towel around his hand, broke a window in a toilet, but didn't have time to actually jump off the train. Well, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs didn't work well. There's different information according to which nobody captured Anankov, and if he had wanted, he could have escaped from Kalgan without any problems. He went horse riding in the countryside, visited Japanese consulate, and met Japanese geishas. He never made attempts to run away. Chapter 2. The Trial. Anankov, tell me where you and your detachment arrived in Semipalatinsk. It was in early October. It's modern Semipalatinsk. This place isn't far away from the old prison. Was Anankov imprisoned here? No, he wasn't. Uh, this prison was for everyone. As for him, he was kept in the inner prison of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs. Now there's the Palace of Youth in its place. The building where that historical process took place didn't remain either. The circuit court of the military collegium of the Supreme Court started its prosecution against Ataman Boris Anankov and the chief of staff Denisov in the Lunacharsky Drama Theater at 5 o'clock on the evening of the 25th of July, 1927. There's a mass grave containing the bodies of white guard terror victims in the park. This is the reason why the trial took place there. My grandfather, Nikolai Tolmachov, appeared as a witness during the prosecution. The White Guard detachment attacked a village, drove people into a large yurt and killed all of them with sabers. Similarly, horrific and vicious murders were committed in Bolachu village. It went down in history as Kuruk Uikara, which meant 40 mournful houses. The hall accommodated about 600 people, and the others stood outside in front of the theater. It was a demonstration trial in every respect. People arrived from Semirechye, Ural, and Siberia. How moreover, there some witnesses were invited, and some came voluntarily. 
Crowds of people stood in a small square near the Nikolsky Cathedral for weeks. The trial took place nearby. Anenkov had shown nothing but cruelty in these arrests. Both real and fabricated statements were made during the trial. Anenkov admitted committing some of them and denied committing the others. I understand that no mercy can be shown to me because of the struggle I was engaged in previously. I had courage to side with Soviet rule and did not resist being brought to justice. I'm leaving as a criminal who has repented and want to think that I will not be under a curse when I will leave. They used bloody terror against people and as a result they suffered from it themselves. In the end they could see only a dire future. It seems that he kept clinging to the hope that until the end, but the result was predetermined. This repentance did not save either the Ataman or his comrades in arms. Clemency was rejected and the sentence was carried out on August the 24th, 1927. There was no firing squad holding guns and nobody commanded the word fire. There wasn't anything like that. A commandant just shot him. All of them were kept in a prison cell. Then a person shot him in the head. That was all. They shot Denisov in the same way. However, the story of the bloody Ataman did not finish there. A bit later, another look-alike appeared. Chapter 3. Conquering the Dragon. This pagoda is situated on top of the Red Mountain. It is called Conquering the Dragon. It is Conquering the Dragon or Strangling the Hydra of the World's Counter-Revolution. A legend has it that Anankov's look-alike was shot in Semipalatinsk and the Ataman was killed later. According to this version, he was kidnapped in Urvashi, but it happened in 1937. Strange reminiscences have remained. The Latvian communist Voldemar Tserulist was subjected to some repression and put in the Tashkent jail. Once a strange man was thrown into his cell, uh, he was wearing a T-shirt, casual trousers and Chinese slippers. This surprised and puzzled men came in and said, Gentlemen, where am I? I'm General Boris Anankov. Yesterday I went into my yard in Urumqi where I lived, was caught, put into a car and then on a plane. Now I'm here. It's interesting that according to Tsirulis' reminiscences, some of Shapayev's fighters were in that cell too. He told us about a few episodes in the life of Shapayev's division and the mental attack shown in Shapayev's film. It's nonsense, there wasn't such an attack, suddenly Anankov started arguing. It turned out that he had been in the headquarters of the White Army units, which fought Shapayev's division again. In 1919, Anankov was in northern Kazakhstan, near the areas where Shapayev was fighting. In theory, he could have been in the headquarters of the White Army when they were attacking Shapayev's division. If that person was the real Anankov, then who had been executed in Semipalatinsk? Where did the White Army's officer spend all these 10 years? What happened to the lookalike later? We don't have answers to these questions. Could Serulus simply have mixed up the surname? Did a decoy pretend to be Anankov, and was it just the Czechist game against some of the prisoners? In this case, we can't understand who their opponent was, why they did it, and what happened afterwards. Probably Tserulis just made it all up. What did he do it for? Anyway, nobody except for Tserulis mentioned Anankov. Epilogue. A strange story. Anankov was not arrested or captured. No acts of violence were committed against him either. This detective story is just fiction. If he'd been captured, the information about this achievement of the Soviet intelligence service would have been published in foreign newspapers and it would have been mentioned during the Semipalatinsk trial itself. They made a decision to return on their own. However, the Czechists influenced this decision too. What kind of influence was it? What did they promise the Ataman, and how did they convince him? 
What for did they need this lookalike? Why did the trial take place in Semipalatinsk but not in Moscow, Omsk, or Almaty? The whole operation related to Amenenkov's return seemed quite strange. There were are too many complications and questions. In addition, the majority of Czechs taking part in it were executed in the late 1930s.